so in this demo, what we're going to go, so I'm going to give you a quick demo, and I'm going to make it interactive. So uh, we're all going to go and do things together. I'm going to play with it, and we're, you're going to ask me questions, and so on. And so for this, uh, the first, we're going to do two things. We're going to install IPFS. Uh, if you haven't installed it, it's pretty quick. Um, and we are going to uh, get on a Gitter channel so that we can write messages to each other. So we can exchange hashes. Uh, yeah. How many people have Node installed that already? A bunch of people. Uh, wow, a lot. So the easiest way to install IPFS is to type npm install dash g go dash IPFS. By far the easiest. Is this the if you already have Node? If you already have Node. So that first one. If you have Go, you can type the, the second one, and it will also work. Except you have to set your environment variables. Go installing Go is a I trip. <laughs> I, I have. I, if you go to the general thing, I described how to do it. If you've got Go installed, I see. In the Slack channel. Um, it's in the Slack channel. I see. I'm not on the Slack channel. Should I jump on it? Questions for everybody that's having trouble. Go to URL ipfs.io. You will see a page like this. Is everyone done installing? Whoever is not done installing, please look at me. Go to that page. You see a button over here that says install IPFS. Click it. Then we can click any one of those links. So you can pick your your build. If you have Windows, we have we used to have it working, but if you have Windows and you only have Windows, I just recommend that you access like some remote system or have a VM. Um, we had it working. Uh, but we don't have like a proper Windows maintainer yet, and so it, sometimes it goes in and out. Um, but anyway, here's the build. You can see other builds. I think there's a free BSD build. We have it run BSD. Just curious, will it work with a Cygnum? It should, yeah. So maybe Windows users can use Cygnum. Yeah. So so if you have Cygnum installed, if you if you can install Linux binaries, then do it. And you probably already know what to do. Type in the command line IPFS and get this thing. As soon as you're able to do this, please raise your hand so I know you, you're, you're there. Yeah. Anybody still installing? I see a couple people. Shall I proceed? You tell me. Great. So IPFS works locally. Uh, I'll delete my local node. Uh, a little bit like Git for now. So we, there are many ways to use IPFS, of course. But we decided to start with a command line use case uh, and start there, and from there expand out. Uh, so for now, IPFS works a little bit like Git, and so you can init a repository. But in the, by default, the repository gets initialized into your uh, user directory. So because the model is that it, it works much better if you have one IPFS node per uh, user on a system. So after you init, you get a repository kind of like this, like you get. Uh, you notice a few things about this init. And by the way, if you want it elsewhere, you can say, you can set the environment variable IPFS path equals, um, you know, you can say export IPFS path, you know, whatever, or, you know, some PWD or something. And that would install the thing there. But if you do that, you have to make sure to set the path everywhere. And it's kind of annoying. So for now, I recommend just installing it at the default location. So once we install it, you see that, what did it do? So I said initializing IPFS node at slash user slash jvent slash dot IPFS. So it created a repository there. It generated a key pair. And it gave me a pure identity. So and Lastly, it said, to get started, enter IPFS cat this huge path with an ugly hash. Uh, so let's look at what that looks like. So I'm here on the site. Can everybody see? Everyone can see this whole thing, right? If you need higher font size or something, please just tell me. So this pure identity, um, it means that that's the hash of my public key. So I can, if you look at IPFS, it has a list of commands. We'll, we'll go through most of these so you don't have to like think about them very much, but you can find all of these. Um, and I should also say that IPFS responds to dash dash help really well. So for every command, so here we have the ID command. We can say ID dash dash help, and it'll say IPFS ID shows the IPFS 
node info. Gives you some arguments and a format and so on. So if I just type IPFS ID, it will give me my own ID. And here we have uh, the hash of my public key. We have my public key. We have no addresses because I'm not connected to the network at the moment. We have an agent version, meaning this is the current implementation that we're writing. We have where this is Go IPFS. Uh, it's written in Go. Uh, version 0.3.1. I think I'm outdated, but we're up to 0.3.2. Uh, maybe. Uh, and then we have the version of the protocol. So, like the web, we adopt the notion of versioning things differently because different implement like a version implementation is different from the actual protocol that we speak. Uh, so, that's how that works. And, uh, great. So, this hash is the hash of this stuff. Uh, and it's over here, right? So, that's the identity that I got. Secondly, it told me to get started, enter IPFS cache, and so a bunch of stuff, right? So let's just do that. And it says, if you're seeing this, you have successfully installed IPFS, and you're now interfacing with the IPFS Merkle bank. Warning, this is alpha software. Uh, check out some of the other files in this directory. Hopefully, this implies that you could potentially, uh, so if we, we're looking here at a path, this readme, we could replace readme, because readme is over here. We could replace readme with something else. So let's look at about. And so that gives us some general description of what IPFS is. Right? Huh, so if cat works, and, and by the way, the whole design of the toolchain that we're going for is close to Git and close to Unix in general. So we're making a whole bunch of small little tools that do a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and everything that you can do in the command line, you can do on the web. Because we have, every single node will have an HTTP API that you can use. Not every single node, but most nodes will have an HTTP API that you can use with JSON directly. So I'll show you that in a moment. But for now, you know, you can, if you can do cat, maybe you can do ls. Hey, look, so about doesn't have any links. But what about the directory above it? That has some links, right? So it has some hashes and some names. And so here's the readme that we saw. Here's the about that we saw. You know, you can you can cat some other things. <laughs> Quick start. You know, that's more more stuff. It's just pumping out data, right? So far, so good. Pretty basic, right? Let's. So that if we can look at data, maybe we're going to add data to IPFS. So uh, here I have like a directory called basic, and inside of it I have like a picture of a cat, I have some other picture, I have some directories and a VM. And I can say IPFS add r dot, and that will add the entire uh, directory. So what happened here? Uh, You'll notice that there's a whole bunch of hashes and paths and so on. So what IPFS add does is our, our way of putting content that's in your local file system into IPFS. So any one of these files can now be accessed by IPFS. So I can say IPFS cat you know, this big hash slash test slash foo. And that gives me the word foo, and so if I just did slash, like basic Unix cat test slash foo, I have the same thing, right? Does that sort of make sense? Is everyone with me so far? I don't want to bore you to death either, because like, this is kind of like really basic stuff to <coughs> get you a sense of how this works, um, and how easy it is to, to add things onto the network. It gets more interesting when we actually connect. So far we're using a command line manipulating data inside our machine, but we're not exposing it to the rest of the world. So if I say IPFS daemon, uh, that starts daemon up and will initialize it and run it and connect to the rest of the network. Ah, I, have, I already have a uh, daemon running. Oh, I have a lot of let me just kill, kill everything else I have. Okay. Uh, cool. 
So I did the demo now. Should work. Cool. And so when I type the name in, it says it now has an API server listening on uh, localhost at 5001, and it has a gateway listening on 8080. What does that mean? It means that it has opened a way to issue commands into the node through HTTP at port 5001. And it has allowed you to view objects uh, at port 88. So to demonstrate that, let's just curl localhost uh, 5001 slash. So this is, this is documented in places, but I'll just show it to you for now because uh, it's somewhere. You can look at the API and you can look at, say, cat. Every single thing you can do in the command line is mirrored on the API. So we can say cat. So what, what did we cat over here? So test slash foo. So we should be able to do arg equals test slash foo. Actually, I need the whole path here. And I return to it. So let's let's try adding stuff. So blockchain view, and I can just pipe it into IPFS add, like you would with any other command in Unix. That gives me a hash, and I can curl it out. It, my computer allowed me to copy paste. Cool. Does that sound make sense? Pretty basic, right? That means you can also view it from the web. So I can go to localhost 8080 slash IPFS slash that, and I can see watching you on the web. So I also showed you that I had some. So what happens if I go to? So I, I did this this cat this whole path. So what happens if we go to instead of this whole thing? We go to test. You can see that. We can go up directories, and we can see that picture of a cat that I described. It's now on the web, right? But but look, notice that I'm going to localhost. So I'm accessing. This is a, a an HTTP gateway that I have running on my local machine that allows me to access IPFS objects from my machine. I'm going to take this. So let's see how many people I'm connected to. IPFS swarm peers allows me to see who I'm connected to. So these are a whole bunch of people. We're connected, we're connected together, and I imagine that some of these will be in the same network. So let's see, where are my addresses? We start with, hmm, do I not have a, oh, once I'm connected, really? That's my, am I not connected to the internet? Yeah. All right, I guess it's the once connected network. Um, all right, so I imagine that these people are some of you. And I've already found you. So you can probably take this link. So if you, if you so far you have the daemon running, you can probably take this link and look at it. You probably have to copy paste it. So that needs to, uh, yeah, sure. No, I don't want that stuff. I don't want anything. Never. Did that work for somebody? It's not coming up in Slack, so I can see it. Oh, am I not connected for some reason? I'll refresh. What good shall I do? Oh, there you go. There we go. Yeah. Did that work for you? Just lose machine, are we hitting? You're hitting your own? Uh, yeah. No. And my Slack is still being there. Yeah. Now, is there some way if I can has to see whether or not I'm here. Uh, yeah, it does work. Mm -hmm. So you saw it? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I've got it. So I just added a file into the network, and you viewed it from your own machine from localhost, right? <laughs> if you wanted to give somebody a link that they could view, we happen to run a set of public gateways uh, at gateway.ipfs.io. This will be, we hope to someday grab a TLD like the IPFS TLE and make this resolvable as just slash IPFS. But that means you can do this, and what this gateway will do 
and so I'll try to reach my computer, pull it out. So this is now accessible by anybody in the network. So just to recap, we went from adding a file from my computer into my local node, and it's now available to the rest of the world. It's so this cool. It's kind of slow, right here. You're seeing it slow. So think about all of the stuff that it's doing. It is, it's running a DHT, uh, and this is alpha, right? Like this isn't like production ready, uh, but it, it has for every single one of these paths, it's resolving things through a DHT and pulling them out. This is a different modeling model of access things. Try refreshing now. Try refreshing. It should still be there, right? Now try disconnecting and try refreshing. How do you disconnect? Like just kill Wi-Fi. And refresh. <laughs> so let's look at so so it's slow for like the one little file access, right? But what if we had a video? So I happen to have some uh, some video like cached locally in a different. Uh, yeah, now it's fast. Now it's fast. Yeah, because it's cached. Because the whole point here is that perhaps the first. Ask access is slow because it has to pull it out from wherever it is and fill it into a whole bunch of caches everywhere. But now that it's there, every single subsequent access is super fast because it's yeah. immutable. And you can reason about that up front. You don't have to ask anybody whether it's immutable. So the way that HTTP does immutability today is that you, you perhaps set up some expiry <coughs> headers and perhaps set an e-tag, but most people anyway always will do an ahead request anyway. And if that doesn't work, maybe and maybe it won't work, right? So with immutability, we know that it works, period. Um, I mean, how are you managing, I mean, are you in alpha, are you managing the cache size, are you expiring? Uh, we do, we do, uh, we have a repo GC which will garbage collect. We will be setting thresholds. This isn't in yet, we have it as a, an upcoming in like the next few weeks. We have a, we're going to set up like thresholds of size for both the files that you're adding uh, and the files that are cached locally, and we'll have like a, some different cache strategies for like you know LRU basically or some other thing to evict things from the cache. Uh, and also the repo format, if you you could actually write different custom repo formats that don't you right now this actually replicates the data because you were pulling it into your OS into IPFS, but some other repo formats might not do that if you wanted to. That's that is a huge mess for a variety of reasons. Uh, so that's not the default, but you could do that. Um. <coughs> this is, I'm running a different node that I had already there with um, some video. Or maybe you could actually try running it from the network and see what happens. That's the whole point, right? So, without caching it, Let's try to look at this video. So if I go to localhost 8080 slash this, I'll start downloading a video from a peer. And so there's only one computer connected to the network that's, that's running this, and it might be overloaded. Let me see if I can uh, see if it's not going. Might not even be really visual. <laughs> Yeah, SSH is not connecting me, that's not so good. There we go. Alright, so that's what we put in. We'll put it again. In the meantime, I'll just turn on my local copy. We'll put it again. Sorry, I'm doing a million things really fast. Great, so that's, this is gonna, I'm running a second node locally. That should be filling my so save send us the just send you the link. Yeah, so this let me make sure that it's there. Yeah, that's there. So this is the link. Now, why is my local node not hitting it? Might not be finding it. Oh, I know what's going on. I haven't Advertise. So nodes, when they come up to the network, they have to advertise what they have, because otherwise how these records would... There's a whole set of like recency problems. Uh, so there's several protocols layered here, where one is making something available to the rest of the network, and one protocol is making something available to the peers you're connected to. 
so the reason this is not resolving right now is that my I have two nodes running and they're not actually connected to each other. I would guess. So yeah, I don't have a connection to myself here. But if I advertise that I have this thing, so if I do IPFS objects. So with with IPFS object, you can actually pull out the specific like this is. That hash there represents a directory in there. And I can actually get it in, in front of us. So this is the actual data inside the object. And if I pipe that into multi-hash, which is a tool that hashes the thing, you can see that this is, these hashes match up. That's sort of like custom part. And I can pipe this back into, I think into custom objects. But, Loading, but it's slow. I wonder, is anyone connected to to this address? So, what is my address? My address is 172.41.22. So, if you run IPFS swarm, peers, rep, 42, 1.22. Oh, there's notice now connected to a whole bunch of people. Oh, you know what it is? So, does this network have multicast DNS working? Mm, that's probably, so it's disabled, possibly. I bet it is. I bet it is, yeah. So we have multiple ways of discovery, right? So one discovery is through the DHT, which is kind of like a slower process. <laughs> Another discovery is locally. Um, yeah, so look, I wonder if this is like both a NAT traversal and local DNS is disabled. Uh, this, is, this is, by the way, why so many of these systems haven't succeeded, is that the layer of problems, the number of problems you have to address in NAT traversal, making things reachable from different networks is very large. And so we've covered lots of bases, but not all of them, as you can see. So some of these, these nodes are not finding each other right now. Has anyone got into play at all? No. He is, he is just playing. Yeah. Cool. Is it playing like reasonably fast? No. He got the first five seconds or ten seconds of it, then it stopped. And then it stopped? Mm. Is anyone like actually playing smoothly right now? No. Yeah. You're playing smoothly? I wonder how many people are actually connected to this node. I'm not. So we have some people connected directly to me, and I bet that these people are able to play it right now uh, quickly. But other people are probably playing it down for the rest of the network. It'd be really useful if you, to, if you had a, a NIM as an option on your demo, on your email, which would just a NIM uh, option. Yeah. yeah. On when you invoke your demon, you can put a NIM on it, which mm. would just simply put a little note field on the right hand side. Yes, that is a great idea. We should, we should do that. Uh, we, that ties into a whole notion of remote naming that we will have. Uh, part of why we haven't gone that route is we don't want to start creating like namespaces for people because people are like... Well, you call it a nim. There is no namespace. <laughs> All right. We could, yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine. We, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, so a lot of people are, are probably connected to me at this point. They can play this. Uh, it seeks relatively, like, so this is from one daemon here all connected it from the other on the same chain, it should find each other. I'll just hack the discovery process. Thankfully we have that, but this is annoying and it shouldn't happen normally. Um, 
So if I do that swarm connect slash so what is it? I'll show you how to It's when, um, so when a whole bunch of, when you try to dial somebody, are you on the same network as we are? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Mm, yeah, so if you're on the same network and you try to dial somebody at an address, and it's a local address, and you can't reach them because you're not on the same network, then you can't, so this is like giving you some insight into the network problems, right? You can't assume that that host isn't there because it might be. You might have just moved the daemon into a location where it actually is. So you have to retry, but you don't want to constantly retry, so you have you have some heuristics around backing off and, and so on. So it's likely that you're not on the same network. I mean, basically, all you have to do is at some point have a, uh, a you know a NAT traversal service outside yep. that does this for you, like Skype and everything. Else. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just choose which one you want. Right. Uh, we have to. So we the way that we are implementing NAT traversal is we're going to run something like Stun over the DHT. So we we have that. <coughs> As we haven't merged into the mainline because it's not fully working yet, and we are going to be doing relay over some nodes. Like some nodes will be blasted saying, like we will provide relay for you, um, and we'll actually, in the worst case, like we will actually do full turn uh, to relay data. Now, one thing we, we haven't uh, talked about, maybe it's coming up, is that even though you're mapping this to the file system, it actually doesn't have to be. You said you can actually map. Like the metadata, like mm -hmm. Apple has a whole bunch of metadata associated with the yep. file with their process, isn't yep. part of the Unix file system. Yep. So, so this is why the Merkle DAG is separate from the Unix FS data structure, where the Unix FS data structure is uh, like layered on top, and you can have other things, right? So you can have like the extended attributes on a metadata object. So you have how do you reference <coughs> an extended attribute? You, you can create a, a, a data structure that represents the Apple file system extensions, and you would have it as an object in there, and it could point to other, to the actual data blocks, and it would have the metadata there. And so the, the, the objects that are IPFS, the running IPFS can pull those objects anyway, but some process has to make sense out of what that metadata means. Yeah. Um, cool, how many people were able to like actually play this so far? A few. <coughs> One, only three, four. I can't connect to the same <coughs> your office. Uh, I just get, you, get you can't connect to the same network? Yeah, so if we're not on the same network, it, it will, you'll be, everyone will be pulling from like one machine that we have running, uh, which is annoying. But uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a sense of like what these objects look like. So we have a way of, of observing, of like looking at the graph. Uh, so we can do this. Uh, GraphMD is a tool that we have that pumps out what the Merkle DAG looks like in dot format. So dot is uh, an old school way to visualize graphs. So this is that directory that I added before that we saw with the cat, right? So here's like what's going on underneath the hood. We have this object that has a bunch of links that point to other blocks and so on. And I think yesterday we messed with JPEG uh, to do this. So here you can see this file has a whole bunch of different sub-blocks, right? That means that this file is being chunked into different pieces. And so it does that for you. Uh, so if we wanted to look at the video, so let's take this hash and say GraphMD and just replace the hash that we have in there. You probably don't have GraphMD installed because we don't install a huge tool chain for you. We just install like the basic thing. This should, oh, this is pulling it from the wrong node. Great, so this is what the video looks like. Hmm. It's like 20 megabytes of video, right? This is like doing the chunking for you. And you can plug in different chunking systems depending on whether your data 
fits a different use case. Like streaming is very different. You would want a different data structure than like fast random access to anything, um, and so on. I can't get on this slide. Can you see the Google short term? Wait, which one? The Google short term URL. Oh, which one? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. You can't get the slide? No. <laughs> Is the internet just like no? It's it's, it's the, my uh, so here's here's the oh sorry that's not the right one because that's going to the other now. Uh, let's do a maybe this should okay I think this is the right one. It's playing. So this is for the Slack people, the people that can't touch Slack for whatever reason. Um, all right, so this is yeah. So this is what the data structure inside looks like, um, and these are these, these are the Unix files added onto IPFS and creating this this really large graph of small objects, right? But any one of these chunks is accessible, right? So we can actually go to the global gateway. So this is like the the, the full gateway. Um, and pull it out there, and like it's just like downloaded a chunk of data, uh, and you can curl that and say, great, like, so, and it's gonna pump a bunch of binary into my terminal where it should. So, so have you looked at um, how uh, since the uh, uh, Sudz does its local namespaces? Um, no, I haven't. I should look at this. It's all NIMS. So what I do is once I agree that your NIM uh, is WAN, um, I just then can, then I can do WANs, um, Christophers, because you have agreed. Ah, uh, yeah. So this works kind of like SFS friends, where you uh, identify specific people and add them to your local to your local namespace. And you have the, the actual mapping of where they are and so on. And there's no, I mean, you know, it's all, you know, there, you don't really worry about collisions because it's all kind all of path based. Your web. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so we will have that around our name system that I didn't go into, into very much. That's, that's a way of doing the CA system in a different way, too. So that's where the SFS tried to go in that direction. That's really like a longer <coughs> topic that we could, we could probably discuss. Um, but in terms of the local discovery, yeah, we can probably do that. Usually local DNS is enabled, and it works really well. But in this network, it, it's not. I wonder what protocols would work in a network like this, other than just standard NAT traversal. Uh, well, I'll, 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 our our experience with Silent Circle with the, the voice over IP yeah. is that the, the, the anybody who has a real IT department blocks almost everything. <laughs> 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 Yep. It's although just, although Google's experience stuff. with Quick recently has shown that uh, something like 70% of traffic from Chrome to Google servers is now running over UDP, uh, which is pretty impressive given the fact that like tons of people just block outright all UDP traffic. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but cool. So that that showed like the the actual graph. Um, we can pull out pieces of this, right? So so where was this? This image, right? So if we look at this image on the web. So this is this picture. Uh, here, let me just put it on Slack. Is Slack not even loading? No. Are we like destroying the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you should be able to look at that picture that way. What kind of thoughts do you have about permissions? So we can implement permissions in a very variety of different ways. I think the best way to do it is through capabilities. Uh, so this is like the e-rights model. Uh, Taco LAFS has done a lot of work pioneering this uh, and like making it work at, like, in a larger scale. And I think like, that's definitely the right model. Like, we want to have data encrypted at rest. So that when you're accessing objects, you're getting encrypted objects, and you decrypt them locally. I'm, I'm thinking of exposing different um, so you, so you can get like the, par uh, the hash of a parent, yep. and it might have multiple files, and you, maybe you only want, some people to be able to see that the one file exists and look at it, and maybe I don't want to show you my birth certificate, but I can show you maybe my email address. Yep. So what, that kind of permission is where it's not even visible. Yep. So uh, where you, 
Yeah, this gets into questions of the routing system. Our view on a lot of this is that your access of specific subset of data has different routing properties, almost. There, there is data that you want generally available that should be routable and viewable by everybody. Things like YouTube videos, things like Wikipedia, things like in the open web, it's a lot of open data. There are other subsets of data that you don't want necessarily accessible, uh, that either you want fully encrypted so people don't understand what's going on, and even if they were happen to get the objects and know the keys, they could check which hashes you're serving. Yeah. In those cases, uh, where like privacy is a serious concern, what you want to do is just have a different routing system that's oblivious and trusted. So you're you're routing only through a subset of nodes or a subset of your data. Okay. Yeah. So and you basically pay the price. Like you trade off um, performance for privacy and, and, and anonymity, right? And like you can get to full anonymity. Uh, but that, that implies using Tor as a or Tor and I2P and other kinds of protocols as the transport and the only transport. Uh, and our solution for a lot of this is to say, make IPFS as a general tool that can plug into any one of these transports and scope all of the network accesses to the routing system and the network layer so that, that you can be you can swap out the entire node and put it on there. And if you want to have a node that works in both locations, have policies around which content gets routed into which part. That is a, a lot of careful design engineering and so on, yeah. but it's it's not only eminently doable, it's stuff that we're already facing and, and thinking about how to clear these two, right? You, you might want a routing system that's friend-based, where, you know, like friend-based, kind of like what um, Chris was talking about, where you have a specific set of people that you know and trust, and maybe you already did key exchange with, and you can route information through those, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a slower routing system. So right? you put the policy at the routing layer, yeah, that's the, and, and you would have multiple routing systems potentially, right? Depending on the application use case, right? So if it's your personal computer accessing all of your data, you might have multiple routing systems that depend on what content you're accessing, and routing different queries to the different ones, um, you know, sending different queries to the different routing systems, sort of like a multi-router, I guess. It's all composable. But, I mean, it's definitely you, know, you have the situation where, so let's say the local name for for. His machine is Juan on mine, uh, but uh, Matthew he calls him um, Ben, and yep. so if you have a route in, it's going to basically go. Oh, it's actually faster for me to go through Matt because it can discover it because it's a unique hash. Yep. And then choose the best way to do it, even though you specified it for mine. So exactly. So this this is what allows you to create a general, any general web of trust on top of IPFS IDs. I haven't really touched the notion of keys here yet. I've only mentioned that nodes have their own public-private key pair, and you can do, you can do key signing to their derived control. But this also means you can build relationships like that and do key exchange uh, with people, identify people by key, and then name those keys locally. So you can mount other people onto your own namespace. Does that make sense? Everybody has a sort of namespace and you can point to it. This is like deeper, this is going like much deeper into like how this changes the, the trust model. Um, but we can can uh, see it. But by the way, so we have this field in this full picture, but in this we can actually grab out independent chunks of this file uh, and view those. So we can actually see this part. And we so what happens if we take these pieces and concatenate them, right? So we can say like cat this into like without JPEG, and we take this other this other piece and concatenate it. So now if we open without J JPEG here, my local file system. See the first two parts. Yeah. That kind of makes sense. Did I lose people here? This is just like hacking JPEG, uh, showing that you can like every single piece of the files that you're accessing are made available through this this resource. Yeah. I saw you uh, sort of mapping this to the Unix file system, and that was pretty compelling. But I also noticed you map this to a blockchain. So I wasn't worried about mining or I just did a proof of stake and blockchain. Why wouldn't I just implement the blockchain on top of IPFS 
So this is this is so exactly the question. This is well, so so it depends on how you define blockchain, um, and this is you know highly controversial because people have different viewpoints on this. But my view is that a blockchain is just a shared ledger that we agree upon, uh, and we have some running head, and we enter a consensus protocol around what the head is at the current moment. So the consensus protocol could be state-based, or it could be proof of work based or so on. You know, I'm not going to get into like the specifics. Your staff, yeah, so you can define any, any you think of IPFS as a transport for all the objects. So every single piece, the blockchain, every block, transaction, and so on, is a different object on top of IPFS. And you just run a consensus protocol to decide what the current head is and to run the other things, right? So, so some of the more interesting blockchains, like Ethereum, for example, has a whole uh, portion of things around smart contracts and running actual code. Yes, but like theoretically, you can implement Ethereum on top of this. Yes, you can. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Is it the data chains that you use is public? I mean, can anybody view the data chains? So this is this was actually what I was describing about the writing system. Uh, if you are putting things into the global writing system, then yes, and this is where encryption comes in. Uh, we don't have this in yet, but what you'll be able to do is define keys so that when you add, every, all the information that you're adding gets encrypted with a set of keys that you specify, uh, and you can specify others at the moment, that moment. And so the data gets added and chunked and thrown onto the, onto the network, but it's encrypted. Uh, so nobody can view it? Or... So I, I won't say that nobody can view it, because that, if, you know, does no does that does somebody have access to your keys somehow? Probably. Uh, who are you going to give those keys to? You have access to it. Uh, can people look at your accesses and try to clean out what information? So you will hear a lot of people in the blockchain crypto space describe you know really secure things that nobody can look at, and they what they're doing is they're taking your files, chunking them, and throwing them onto the network, and then saying, oh, it's all safe now. Uh, that set of people does not understand this problem, a really big problem in crypto that, that is known as like the, the oblivious RAM uh, based on like access patterns. So, so let me describe this slightly better. So um, if you have a large array of memory in the network with a whole bunch of data and it's all encrypted, but when you access it, you pull out different pieces, there are, there are attacks that based on the access pattern that you're running can detect what the data, what data is underneath if they have a way of guessing, uh, of guessing things. But uh, the data is already encrypted, right? So yes, but this is a way of like figuring out what's what the bits are underneath. So so this is a serious problem, which is that the way that you hide these is you you blow up the access pattern by large factors, and so you, you access many parts of the file and you hide away the access pattern. Uh, and so most things out there that just encrypt your data and throw it onto the web are probably not secure to the to, to these kinds of attacks. So. We take security seriously, and so we won't say like, oh, just encrypt it and you're done. Encrypting and, and just throwing it up there um, definitely defeats like a large swath of attacks, and people won't be able to see it and will just see encrypted stuff. But a very sophisticated attacker with a lot of computational power can still potentially observe what you're doing in the right system, and perhaps even like do the easiest thing, which is to break into your computer and grab your keys, right? <laughs> like, fundamentally. So. Uh, to do proper privacy and proper anonymity, like you have to be very careful about where you put and announce blocks, right? And so this is where where the distinction between the routing systems comes in. So, by the way, this is like what we're talking about here is like Dropbox level security already. You know, with basic encryption, you get that kind of thing. This isn't like um, you know, like true proper privacy is like way harder, and this is what I'm describing as as having the aura problem. Right. right now, if you, if you store things on Dropbox, they're not even encrypted at rest. Right? So this is like most of your data right now is just sitting in the clear. Uh, most of people, most, a whole bunch of companies have access to it. A bunch of people look at it. It's not like we're very far away from like a real secure environment. Yeah? Um, do you have instructions that you can point us towards for downloading or installing Crash MT? Uh, yeah. So a lot of the things are just, I wonder if it, this is here. No, nope, it's not there yet. Uh, I think RefMD comes with, I'm trying to remember where I put it. Total guess. Yep, there it is. 
So you should be able to just curl that into place. You should never really do this because the binary, but. So that you you know that nothing fishy happened. Uh, raw. Want to help? So. If anybody really wants to verify the hash, you can. I was going to say. I've been warning people about curl. Oh, I know. I know. Bash. <laughs> Oh, I know. I, I wrote a little thing called Hashbike uh, that's more of like a joke than anything. But it's like, it, it's a, it pipes only if the hash matches. So, so like, you know. Um, you should never pipe bad hash. What's that? You should never pipe bad hash. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should put that as a tagline. Uh, yeah, so the idea is like, you can just, if you distribute a hash out of band, in some secure channel of some sort, then you can at the very least put that into into your into your pipe um, and prevent disaster. Right. So like you could pipe it like that. If you're gonna tell people to curl things into shell, <laughs> do it that way. So at least they know. But of course, you know you can totally break into the site and change the hash and all that kind of stuff. So it's just security is about raising the bar, understanding the attacks that people will be running and raising the bar. Um, Many, in many cases, people can just hide stuff called security. So, yeah. So, I, I download this movie that you put up on IPFS. Mm -hmm. Am I automatically now serving that content to other people, or do I have to designate so my own? So, currently, storage? in the current installation that you have, when you download it, uh, it's if you didn't explicitly add it, it's only cached, so it will clear from the cache eventually. And right now, you currently are serving to other people should they request it from you. We will have policies to say no to that, of saying being able to distinguish between storing something locally and sending it out, and be able to distinguish between um, like just not ever touching certain files. Like you'll be able to, we will have invariably it'll come up that we will need block lists where lists of hashes that people should just not grab, and you know we, we can have just like a like a like a running blockchain almost. With like the current state of the of the block list, and people can just update that and see what what are the things that people shouldn't download. And different different groups and different societies will think about these hashes differently, right? Because I, fundamentally, I'm against censorship, uh, but I do recognize that in some cases, some groups of people don't want to engage in distributing certain amount certain types of content, which is totally fair. Uh, so for those use cases, we have we're going to have these block block lists. And the cat, I mean, it's just taken from the web cache, or is IPFS caching the content? I think that's caching the content itself in, in, in its local uh, awesome. processing, yeah. And that local storage could be in memory, or it could be in disk, or it could be in S3. We'll have an S3 node really soon, where you'll be able to just type IPFS daemon and pass in some S3 credentials, and it'll boot directly from S3 with that as a cache. Or like that as a, as a local storage. Yeah? There's no sort of. Google search engine or way to call for content for hashes that are supposed to be publicly served and available right now. Right, there, currently there isn't. Okay, uh, so there would be a way to do that? Yeah, I mean, like there's all sorts of, of cool ways to do search over these kinds of webs. I mean, and I mean, all these objects have the links, so all you have to do is just listen for the roots and just crawl it. Okay. It's, it's pretty, it's like a trivial thing that it's just waiting for somebody to hack it together. So someone's, someone's going to hack together a, a URL, a URL <laughs> shortener and someone's going to hack together yep. a search engine. Yeah. So, by the way, so the namespace is how we get nice names, right? So obviously these hashes are really ugly and annoying, um, and I, again, I haven't really explained the name, um, the name system. But the way that that works uh, is that, let me see if I can do it here. Oh, I had it here, yeah, from, from two days ago. So, in case um, Normally, we're used to hmm. names like this, right? 
We're used to these names that are really nice and understandable and that are sort of on top of DNS. Uh, for a variety of reasons, DNS is not a great namespace for us because we want mutability that's really fast. So most of our content is immutable. We want some amount of mutable content. The way we do that is with uh, public private key pairs. So you get, you can generate any key, and the hash of the public key is a name that you control now because you generated that key, which means you can send out records into the system that update that, that namespace. So that's what IP. NS is for yeah. the main system. Uh, and so those records right now just write on whatever routing system you're using, which for now is a DHT, could be something else, could be local DNS, could be all these kinds of things. Could be the Web of Trust model, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you still need pretty names, right? So for pretty names, there's a whole bunch of, there's DNS already, and there's, you can run different DNS root servers if you wanted to. You could use Namecoin, you could use all these other different systems that already exist, or that are emerging around using pretty names. And so all you have to do is establish mappings from those to the IP NS name, and then from that one to IPFS. Okay. So we already have this working where you can take a, a path, an, either an IPFS path or an IPNS path, add a DNS record, and then resolve things like, uh, so you, you would go to like gateway and say IPNS, you know, <coughs> foo.com slash bar. Like that already works. Um, so it's just like, I'm not gonna, wait till like a DNS update. I could demo this, but like, I'm not going to wait for like a DNS update uh, to propagate to the network. Um, you could probably have a demo where like I run a local DNS server or something, but like a local DNS server, not like a, an MDNS thing, which is overloading in terms. Uh, cool. I, I can show you IPNS updating, though, if you want to see it. Like, I can take yeah, this. I know you guys are working on it now, so. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of cool to see. Like, so, uh, I haven't shown any to you mounting. So let's see. By the way, this stuff that you see is stray traffic hitting hitting our our like server. It's just like stray packets that are not IPFS, like just being like, oh, this thing is not right. We'll silence this. Um, so what's go. the what is the ecosystem model as far as supporting? At this point. I, mean, I think that's the you know the big thing that you have a, a system that requires a certain amount of generosity um, for people to participate in. Uh, no, no, no. So the system on its own doesn't specify replication. It just is a transport for how you might go about organizing, moving around the data. So it's it's think of it as a new kind of HTTP that's data structure aware. Well, I'm just saying, but, but it's still a point. So this is where we have, so we will be building some other protocols. Filecoin is one of these, where it's around organizing people to distribute data in exchange for money. Right, and so there will be a whole suite of protocols around figuring out different pieces of the networking world. And we'll make some of those. Other people are already making those. Those. The important piece in all of this is to find a common layer for distributing the data structures, and that's what we're building first. Um, What's that? Um, so it would be on specific. If you're relying on our gateways, then they could steal as those. But you don't have to rely on our gateways. You can set up your own bootstrap, right? So. IPFS already has this bootstrap command, and so those those are like the these are the nodes that it uses to bootstrap the DHT. So you can choose a different set of bootstrap nodes, and it'll work. Um, by the way, so the process, the process to mounts. So I can now go into. I'll show you how easy it is to publish a website, by the way. This is kind of cool. So I can go into sites. I think they have something here. Uh, yeah, so this is a this is static website. This is trivial. Like you just uh, dash r, and now I can take this, this hash and look at it. Oh, this is, oh, this is the, sorry, this is the web UI. I'll show you that. I don't think I, I show you this. 
this is the interface of my node. Um, and by the way, this pulled down a web app. So this hash up here is a specific web app written in today's like technologies, this is React, uh, and it pulled out, you, you can access it by going to localhost colon 5001 slash web slash web UI. I can give you that link. Uh, and you'll, you'll hit this, which will show you like the connections that you have to peers. So these are like the, the people that you're not connected to. So right now my node is connected to a whole bunch of people in Europe. Uh, it's connected to a few people around the US. There's people in Australia. And you can inspect those connections and see where they are and who they are. And you get their public key there, and you can see all of it. Um, you can use this web UI as well to browse like objects in the DAG, so we can look at, you, we can introspect the, the web UI itself. We can enter a hash here and look at what's in there. So here's like an index file that has the data inside of it. So why would mine be so slow to get that? Because it's trying to get the, the app from someplace else. Yeah, so it's, we actually distribute the, the web app from the network itself. Are you, is it being slow for you right now? Let me, um, make that faster. So our gateways clear all the content on them like every few hours because like that's a good idea to do. But by just accessing anything on the way gateway you force all sorts of machines to cache things. So this is right now pulling a whole bunch of content onto the gateways. We should make it faster for you now. If you refresh it'll probably go faster. Yeah, right now we're seeding most of this content from like one little server somewhere. Uh, we're gonna be moving to seeding all of this out of S3 pretty soon. We just haven't moved that yet. Because um, in most networks it's fast, fast enough that it works, but uh, like like when I accessed it, I pulled it from the network, so it was faster for me, but where was I? Here, yeah. Uh, yeah. You'll notice that we forbid looking at other hashes inside of the 5001 port. This is because 5001 has the access to the API. So it's a JSON API. Um, and if we didn't do that, then people could like, make your node do arbitrary things. So you can expose that. To, if you run, you're, you're going to run IPFS in a Docker container, you can do this. But um, so I'll show you a booting VM. So this is, let's see if this works. You might be able to run it yourself too. So If you have Fuse installing your machine, you might be able to follow along, so I will add this make file. If, if you want to try, if you have VirtualBox and Fuse, you might be able to follow along, but we're going to clean this up and make it a lot easier, but you can... <coughs> boot an entire VM off of IPFS. So I have this make file here, uh, and what it does is that it has this boot sequence, and it tells VirtualBox to create a VM, 
and the and you know creates it provisions the whole VM because VirtualBox wants you to do it from the command line. Um, there's probably some way to do it another way, but we just kind of got around to it. And it registers an ISO that's at slash IPFS slash you know some hash and so on. So this is going to try and boot the entire VM from IPFS itself. So type make, and it turns the VM on, and now it's booting. So that booted a whole VM out of IPFS. So you might, if, again, if you have Fuse, this should probably work for you. Uh, if you have Fuse in VirtualBox, it will work. It's not super smooth yet, because it's doing a lot of things that are that Fuse doesn't expect, and VirtualBox doesn't expect. But we're, this is a new way to distribute VMs, right? So like now, I'm like gonna run it. So that was like the boot sequence, and now this VM happens to be running IPFS inside of it. So we're now, we boot a VM out of IPFS that itself is running IPFS, and now it's like launching. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So for those of you that understand like how, what a mess it is to move around ISOs and VMs and do provisioning in the cloud, like, this is like really sweet, really, really sweet. Yeah, and can, it's now running its own daemon. I wonder if I can connect to it. So I don't remember how to get another shell on this, what key combinations I have to enter so that it will give me a terminal. But who knows? Um, maybe I, I can tell from my Probably e box. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I figured that out better. But yeah, it's it's running. So we have VMs running out of it. Because we can do the same thing with Docker containers uh, and so on. We give, we have put entire Docker registries on IPFS itself. So you could use IPFS as a transport for Docker images. And so you would be in one machine and, and create a Docker image and just, like, as you create it, it gets added to IPFS. And in another machine, you just say Docker run the hash, or, you know, if you have a name, it will be the proper name. And it'll just run the container, right? Just, like, pull it out of IPFS. How is it different than Vagrant? What's that? How is it different than Vagrant? The Vagrant looks the same thing, right? Vagrant is just a tool around simplifying the boot process for VMs and allows you to create a Vagrant file around your project to specify how to provision the VM. This is different. This is like, Vagrant uses HTTP to move around the boxes. This is a different way of moving the boxes that's peer-to-peer -peer aware. So that if you're in a data center and you're pulling a, 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 an image or a, or a VM, either a VM image or a container image, from some remote location, and you're pulling it from like 20 machines. Those 20 machines are actually we're going to start are going to start pulling the files from each other instead of from the source. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, another cool thing that you can do is take a. Let's see, this works. Uh, this file. So this this file here is. I'm going to curl it lovely. All right, I just cut it. Let's see if it gets it. Oh man, am I not connected to the network anymore? This file here is, you know, some path slash play. This happens to be an HTML page, and it has some JavaScript in it that will load. It'll it'll grab the an argument out. It'll grab a hash from the address, and then it'll create an HTML5 video element out of that hash, and so it will play. The video through the web with an HTML5 player 
by pulling it out, out of IPFS. So check it out. So this is why it, why it has these different pieces, right? So, so to, uh, this is that player, and here's that argument. So that argument is, we can look at it. It has a video in there. So video.mp4, we can ls that and see like, different blocks. Right now it's doing like a stupid standard, like just chunking every once in a while. We'll be doing content-based chunking soon. Uh, and you can start playing it. So now that is, Fetch some, fetch some JavaScript from the network, started running, told it to fetch another object from the network, which is the video, and starts playing it. This is a full JavaScript player running from IPFS. So this is why you can do, you can build like distributed web applications this way, because you can, like that local, like that web UI, you can deploy the entire website through IPFS, and people can load it locally. And so I could actually. If other people are running this here and we disconnect from Backbone, it was still assuming we can find each other, which you know sometimes depends on the network. Um, we can find each other and like connect and start serving from each other. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So for my own app, I've been trying to figure out the, the parts that I can use. Mm -hmm. I haven't yet found a part that I can. Um, <laughs> basically, so each task would have let's say we do an image annotation. So I can store all the images as part of the task using IP. So it's that the test for done is a smart core transfer. I can store on IPFS and prove that it never been changed and therefore IPFS and have a contract run that download and run that code and prove that it's and it access all the, all the content within that all the IPFS. Then I could store the entire website itself on IPFS. And for my developers, I could store the development environment on IPFS, so that they could just come along, download the environment, start developing, upload the environment to IPFS, and then everyone everyone can go. Yep. That way. And how much would this cost me? What do you mean? What's the what's the cost? It's nothing, right? <laughs> nothing. nothing. I mean, it's just it's just like <laughs> you would just. It, it just a matter of figuring out what access pattern around these objects you want, and that's it, and then you can just run it. And you don't even have to use our gateways, you can run your own, uh, you can run your own network, and all the hashes will still not collide with each other, so you can take your network and join it to the right global one or not, as you would desire. Um, and so yeah, uh, we can actually take the entire, um, so I'll walk you through how you, you, you would deploy like a, like a, so you always have the web UI, and that's like a, that's not a static website, right? Like this is actually like a full web app, as written today, um, deployed with IPFS. Where is it? Here, is that it? Yeah, so this is like a full dynamic web app running from IPFS. Of course, if it accesses some other services like databases and so on, you're going to have to figure out a way for that, those to access it. So this is still, um, like, you, you can come up with different ways of doing that, which is to use CRDTs or operational transforms and all the kind of stuff that, we, that is really exciting convergent uh, data structures. That's a whole other thing. Like most people today will just like plug it into standard database or whatever, or even use IPFS as a database itself, which is what I would do. Um, but you can deploy dynamic web apps with this today. Like I could continue running this by from this by disconnecting from the network. By the way, did you end up pulling any of this down? Did that end up working for you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I'm. Like for instance, under the config, I can see the private key. What's you know, yes? What's so the, that's going to be removed out of there. Like we've been meaning to move it out for like weeks well, now. What it reminds me though is like you have a different private key format than what um, uh, say. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. This is that format is final. So we just use it for now. If you look in our in, so all of this development is, is open. Anybody can come in and, and tell us to up, do things differently. It, we try to do the best thing. Possible, like the only constraints we have is that it really has to be able to work ubiquitously. And so, what we'll do for the key formats is that we'll have a way, like an IPFS object that's going to wrap the key and then specify which format it is and have it embedded in there. So, we want to be multi format. Wherever we can, we don't want to lock in people to using format X. We want to be able to plug in ways to understand different formats into the system. So, we'll, we'll use a standard like PEM and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, like right now we just did that because it was like simpler. 
for us. Uh, we have, in fact, like this spec right now. If we go to GitHub. Uh, yeah, Keystore. So if we do, we have the specs. Um, um, one of our devs put uh, Keystore review. We have this like, this is like some amount of review on um, a spec in here, which is Keystore, which is how we store and use keys. Um, but this is like not implemented yet, and it's we're just discussing it. It's like the beginnings of it. And we can do things very differently, and so on, if desired, if like relevant, right? Um, no. So, as far as the funding for this and for Filecoin, mm -hmm. where is that coming from? So, um, this comes into why we're doing what we're doing. So, when I came up with IPFS, uh, I thought pretty hard about what I wanted out of the out of the internet uh, and out of the web. Meaning, like, there's a whole set of problems that I want to fix. Um, and no current good channels for doing so. And I want to build, like, if AT&T Bell Labs was still around, I would go try and join there and, like, work there. But it's not there yet, right? And so I want to build a small R&D shop for protocols and tools where we can make protocols like IPFS and the massive tool suites that come along with these kinds of systems. Uh, and we can move pretty fast uh, and propose them to the rest of the world. And I, when I set up on this like journey after coming up with this, I was like, whoa, oh my god, this is huge. We should start moving to this. Uh, I decided to build a company to be independent. And so we will be building things like Filecoin and thing, other protocols like that that will be sources of revenue for us. Um, but tons of our protocols will be completely open source. And if you look, like IPFS is MIT licensed, right? So it's not even like GPL or anything. Um, it's all in Go right now. Uh, the main Go implementation, yes, is in Go. So uh, this is like MIT license somewhere. It's in there somewhere. License. MIT. Um, if you look at Go IPFS, yeah, it currently it's in Go. There's a whole bunch of people on it. Uh, but yes, MIT as well. Um, and I need to change those licenses to reflect Protocol Lab Sync, which is the name of the company now. Um, but we will, uh, yeah, so everything is open. And we want the best idea to win, right? So anybody can come in. We get pull requests and issues from all sorts of people. Uh, the majority of the people building IPFS, like in terms of numbers of people, are actually outside of the organization. So we. Like, if you look at the development of the internet, the majority of these protocols were built by people that really cared about those protocols existing and made them happen across organizational boundaries, and this is how we're doing it too. Um, and yeah, that's. You were asking, I think, another question that I lost, but. Yeah. Where did you get funding from? Oh, we, I mean, we, we're building a company and we we're building a business to <coughs> raise money from investors. So, yeah. and. We went through YC, so last year, so if you want a name, that's one name that we can get. But so far, we, we don't like giving names out because, like, we're, we're building a very different kind of company, right? Like, we're, we're building a company that's focused on upgrading the internet, and that's not what most people do. And uh, we have a very unique approach to doing it. We are building protocols, we're building tools, we're building things like Filecoin, which is very different than more mainstream. We're, in the, we're kind of in between the world of, like, blockchain, crypto space, and you know, DevOps faster, make high performance tools for the world, and we're like squarely in the middle. Um, and we like, we're building our own thing. So, yeah. Does that make sense? I don't know if, if I'm like getting muddled and lost in my own description of these things, but feel free to ask more questions. You're a for profit company. Yes, so Protocol Labs is a for profit company, yeah. And so a lot of people are like, well, why did you do that? Well, if you look at Mozilla, uh, Mozilla actually has a really big for profit arm. Right? And they need that because if they don't have that, they wouldn't survive. Uh, and so, you know, when I started this, I was evaluating options like, well, should I go into academia and build a protocol and then lose it to, uh, you know, publishing papers and never see it go anywhere? Or should I go to Mozilla and try to convince a lot of people to like give me funding to like build this? 
or should I go to Google and try to do the same thing? Which because <coughs> Google actually today does most of the R and D for protocols on the internet. Like that's straight up Google. Um, and I wanted independence. So like I, I wanted uh, to build an organization that where we can focus on the problems that we want to solve, yeah. and we just need to find a way to sustain it. And this is where things like Falcon come in. Um, so yeah, we, we've been kind of silent about this for now because we 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 had a bunch of. Uh, early success with IPFS, so we are like, just building it out. But this is going to be a a, uh, a protocol around moving data and storing data, and backing up your data for you uh, using cryptocurrency, and anybody can join it. So, so we care about building these these. A subset of the protocols we'll be building are cryptocurrency operated, meaning I like I like to use the analogy of a coin operated machine. So we want to build coin operated machines that people can then deploy out there and make money for themselves. And we will run a lot of those, and we will make money that way. Um, yeah. That kind of makes sense. Cool. But the primary is that revenue generates will be some appreciation of your currency. Not necessarily appreciation. Uh, of, perhaps uh, that is definitely one of the strategies that we're going to look at. There's other protocols that we'll be writing. So Falcon is not the only protocol that's cryptocurrency operated that we'll be doing. Um, but yeah. If you want to guarantee the availability of certain content, do you have to run your own node to make sure that that's currently yes? Can so, so IPFS can't tell like <coughs> this became a sort of a clear thing early on, right? Like um, this is why we we built Filecoin. Uh, and why it didn't make sense to put it inside IPFS. Like, you don't want your transport to also dictate who stores what, because that severely limits the range of possibilities of your transport. If you're in, in a data center use case, and you don't care about encrypting things at that level because you want it to be really high performance, uh, and you control the network entirely or whatever, um, and you don't want to go out and route things through the broader internet, but you have your own thing, um, you don't want to have to like store other people's stuff. You only want to store your stuff in the set. Uh, likewise, uh, if you might not want to store illegal content, right? You don't necessarily want, if by using IPFS or applications that use IPFS, be forced to store illegal content, period. Like that's just not an option. And so it is a different thing, it's a different layer of the stack to say, we're gonna write a protocol around uh, ensuring that stuff is available and online, and that's what Podcoin is. It's, it's, it's the way it's going to work is you're going to give it a, a an IPFS hash, and it's going to grab all this up this stuff and chunk it into smaller blocks and distribute them across the public network, and then reward uh, the preservation of those objects there. But even in file point, not everybody has to um, mirror all the data that's being requested. Oh, correct, store. correct. Yeah, of course. Only so subset. So if you yeah, want to make other... sure that something is available to all people over a long period of time. Yeah. Because you also mentioned like the permanent permanency component, but you could still have broken links in IPFS. Yes, if, if somebody's not serving it. If it's right. no longer being served. This is this is why Falcon is an integral part. Falcon and other protocols like it, because it's not just Falcon. There could be other things, right? So there could be other protocols that are around organizing how people store and serve things, like you know, maybe things like S3 or Google Cloud or like all of these things that today are dominant systems that if you want to store something, you use those, period. Uh, they should be able to plug into IPFS. Right? Yeah, like, certainly other distributed, um, other uh, distributed things using like DNS uh, technologies that people are doing and they're running with the limits of them right now. So. Yep. In Filecoin, it sounded like uh, you're paying for preservation, not for cert not for actually delivery. Yes. Yes, correct. Can I ask the, the architectural decision behind that? Yeah, um, you know, archival is a very different process than serving things quickly, uh, and you want a very different kind of node, right? So, in archival, you want the cost structure to look like lots of really cheap storage that isn't necessarily the fast thing to access. So, if you actually look at Amazon Glacier, it they have a huge like tape for, tape system. Uh, it's super cheap, right? It's, so. Yeah. I literally had something relatively sort of take it by the pre-internet and moving on. 
it was called Nightnet, that basically was the same thing, but, which is that uh, you were rewarded for being able to deliver information overnight. <laughs> yep. That that was fast enough for a number of different purposes. Yeah, so, so uh, this, is, this is why I talk about it's around archival and long-term preservation of things. And, uh, and we will have other protocols in that space. This is where BitSwap comes in. Uh, I described the exchange layer uh, to deploy. <coughs> and, and in the, by, in archiving is at one end and really fast, quick response to the network, being able to understand what is the hot content and be able to move it and deploy it to a specific location. We have some stuff coming out there, but we just haven't had time right now Are those to develop going to be it. Other coins? Are those going to be other uh, other possibly, we may use coins that already exist. Like, ultimately, we're not necessarily about reinventing wheels. We just want to use the thing that's best. It made sense for a lot of reasons in Flatcoin to create a, a coin there. Um, it may or may not make sense in some of these to make coins as well. Uh, it'll depend. Cool. What I want to end up with is a really massive network where people have a CDN that's. Um, Hyper locality aware. So I'm talking about putting systems inside buildings where somebody in this building would be like, "Great, I can run a Filecoin node or a Filecoin or like this other thing node and serve content out of that, and it would know what content is being, what types of content should it be requesting." Do things like proof of latency. Exactly. Yep. So you use the speed of light as your exactly. Yeah, so we may or may not be headed in that direction. <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you have um, already implemented an IPFS or on the roadmap for the, the fog computing concept? So the Internet of Things, mm -hmm. many devices that are maybe battery powered and cannot be hi highly verbose. Yes. So they're yeah, not so necessarily doing stuff, but something ad adjacent to them. Yeah, yeah. So, so serving as the brain. They would still be able, our model for that is that they would be running an IPFS node but they wouldn't be using a routing system that's DHT. They would be using a delegated routing that goes through some other set of devices, right? Um, yeah, that's, that's the model there where like you, you don't want to have your watch be part of a DHT because you don't want it serving things and you don't want it having to request things through a very slow process. That will probably delegate to some other sort of system. It's like it's sending network. its signal to something else that's, right. th that's doing computation. Sorry. But the point though is that you can use IPFS as a transport in that device. That device can just implement the, the protocol and use a simple routing system and a simple network layer that plugs into whatever else it's already using. But the links work the links work in the computer, the links work in the server, and the links work in the watch. Or the fridge or whatever you want. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the idea there, right? And uh, yeah, so so we Somebody pointed out that why not just implement a blockchain on top of IPFS, and that's exactly right. Why not put Git on top of IPFS? Actually, you can. We have this thing called, uh, so when, when GitHub was getting hammered, we built this thing called Git Repost IPFS. So I can take any random GitHub thing, like this one's probably getting pretty big, so I'll just do like, you know, this repository, which is like our, our like the first repository, and it can be like, Get your host IPFS, and I just pass it a thing, and what it does is it pulls it down with Git, and then uploads it to IPFS. And so now, if I go here, uh, this should this is the actual Git repo being served out of IPFS. Right? So like it's a it's a full functioning Git repo, um, and I can then go Git clone that, and so I can like. Oh, I guess I did somewhere in there. And so it'll probably be a little, depending on the network here, it'll probably be a little bit slow because of the network, but it worked. Like, Git is now cloning it out of IPFS. And I can, I can do, like, get, I can replace, <laughs> I can replace the gateway with local hosts, right? And so that worked. Uh, if it grabs the objects for whatever reason it seems to be pretty slow. I don't know if it's the, the thing that it there we go. So now it's CDI PFS. I have a git repo. Right. Git status. 
cat license, cat readme. You know, it's that thing. So <laughs> if get, if GitHub gets hammered again, you'll push Origin master. <laughs> not yet, but we we are headed there, right? So because because again, you can you can wrap Git with IPFS. We are we're gonna be finding a good way to do that to link. So if Fuse was better. If Fuse would really allowed us to mount in arbitrary file systems really easily and mount paths, we could do this very, very simply. But Fuse isn't that. Like, it's supposed to be, but it isn't. The implementations kind of suck, uh, particularly on OS X. Um, I'm not even going to touch Windows. <laughs> I, it, I don't even know if there is one. Uh, so we've been thinking that there's a lot of code around uh, 9P, which is the Plan 9 file system system that did a lot of this work and v9fs is a thing that looks a lot like fuse but it's based on plan 9 and it's just better uh, and we might go into that but that could be a huge dragon in its own it's, it's a huge dragon already so we may or may not do that will depend uh, we predict that OS's are going to get better about how they do file systems once the docker container style model of the world takes more hold in that your OS, instead of running everything across the main file system, is going to give every application its own container. And when every application has its own container and its own view of the file system, it becomes a lot easier to map things in there. Um, instead of Because they're already doing file system mapping at that layer, so it's easier to plug in there than to plug into the whole full OS. So, um, are you going to run on Windows at some point? Uh, we, we, do run on, kind of we sort of already do. Somebody got it working. We then broke the build. Um, okay. What about mobile? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. So somebody okay. recently, like a few days ago, uh, and what was it? Uh, yeah, this guy. Um, cool guy. He an attempt to port the IPFS system to iOS. So somebody is already running it on iOS. Uh, and I mean, this is running the full DHT there, so it's probably going to be a little bit like resource intensive. Uh, but we'll have like dedicated way, like we'll have builds for this kind of thing where you get this like which system to use. Okay. And, and already right now you can do that, like you can disable DHT and you can disable um, local DNS. Uh, but uh, yeah, like the full. Cool. Cool. So we'll just implement Ethereum on uh, IPFS and then run it on this. Yep. So that, that should work. All done. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're building like this new layering of things. Yep. Uh, you have comments on distributed processing. This is yeah. processing. Yes, so <laughs> uh, I had a part of the reason in that I developed IBFS was that I was um, I wanted to build like this massive Erlang style VM across the entire world where you had all these very tiny little cheap processes that were just like one function and doing a little bit of work and you, they all had like a little Bitcoin address and so you could call functions and give them a little bit of money and that function would like use a little bit of money to like call other functions. Uh, and I was like, okay, well the first step is build it, we need a place to sort of file, like the functions, so let's build a file system. And like we're there, uh, we're we're heading in that direction. I think a lot of other people are in that in that time period. Ethereum came up, and like that's also what they're doing. Very similar. Uh, they have a notion of an Ethereum VM. Um, it's possible. There, there's from a very different angle of things. This actually looks a lot like the Plan Nine processing model, right? Where you have a whole bunch of computers and different OSs uh, all networked together and able to talk to different processes there. So it's possible that we might go in, like the world might go in that direction if the Go team decides to start writing an OS, which I would love. Um, yeah, not clear what's going to happen, but what it is, what is clear is that we're going to make, we're going to go from this like large VM running very large application model to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, being able to run in different places, and this is really good for information flow control because you can understand which functions are running what code and what trust you place in them with what data. So finally, all of the capabilities research that has been brewing for decades around how to properly 
figure out wh who should touch what data, it's going to come into the world. So that'll be cool. Uh, we're getting there. Which is why I'm very concerned about Ethereum because I think they're in complete denial that there's any good code out there that didn't be written by them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no comment. <laughs> I, I think like they're doing a lot of really cool stuff. No, no, they're, they're doing a lot of really cool stuff. I love their stuff, uh, but they're twiddling all the dials at once. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I think like, I think that if you come up with a, an idea as cool as Ethereum, like it's hard not to want to do that. And if, you ha if you're already building this whole thing that is very new, it becomes really attractive and appealing to try and just like not get caught up in the old uh, things and try to create something new. Uh, I take a position somewhere in the middle where like I want to be able to create everything independently, but write tiny, take as many good ideas as we can that we already know about and see which of them makes sense, write the right model, and put these like tiny layers of abstraction in between so that we can always interoperate with the past and should we need to swap out pieces of the system. So I, I take a, instead of like creating a, a like, yeah, so this is actually completely unrelated to Ethereum, but this is related to a, uh, a conversation we have with another friend who want, wants to write an OS um, from scratch and build a lot of things. And it's a, a really brilliant idea, amazing thing altogether, like an amazing project. Um, uh, and my, my view is like instead of like creating like a whole new cyber from scratch, like do, start doing right organ transplants over time towards that. So yeah. Anyway, so this is PFS, It works. Uh, by the, uh, I will say, come and hang out in our IRC channel if you have any questions. I will add it here. You put your um, your presentation in the teacher's presentation thing. And yeah, we'll do. Swarm. So what? Slack. What about, um, <laughs> what about the, the scalability of this? The, okay, I can use it. I can use it pretty much now. I reckon. For, for small things, right? But what if you start to really scale up the usage of like this work? At what state can you say that this is this is ready for mass deployment? Yeah, so you could so right now you can run your own cluster and it will work really well. Um, parts where it gets a little bit clunky is when a whole bunch of nodes out in the middle of like nowhere, like in a network like this, start connecting to the DHD and trying to do things and so on. So this is why our public gateways are like sometimes messy. Um, we have bugs that we have to fix. Uh, like you can do it. You can use it for simple stuff like serving files. Like you, you could replace static file serving with IPFS already. And by the way, recently, like um, you know, like there's, there's a site with like millions of views who is super excited about IPFS and wants to switch to IPFS as soon as possible. So we're working with them already to make that happen. Um, and like it's, we're gonna test out a lot of the, we're gonna fix a lot of the bugs right now that are preventing this from becoming like fully performance ready, like per, uh, production ready. There, uh, we've just put it off because a lot of the cool, more exciting work is more researchy than it is uh, fixing the bugs for production of readiness. But we're we're on that path. Yep. So from a one implementation. What's that? What's that? There's, there's, there's so many things that I want to do with this. Yeah. To start with the file server and move, move on from there. It's just like what you were saying with the organ transplant. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So, so already you can, you can, you know, if you go to ipfs.io, we'll, we, all, we will be self-hosting very shortly. Right now we're running off of GitHub pages, but there's already a mirror that works up the gateway. So right now, it's, I guess, a, yeah, so it's like not super perfectly fast yet. This is why we haven't fully self-hosted, because we, we have like some perf to fix. But this is the site running out of IDFS, and like it all works. You can go to the install pages, look at the examples, uh, look at the project. Yeah, so see that, like, that's a couple seconds of lag, which is unacceptable for web browsing. This is why we haven't self-hosted, because uh, we we're, we're moving that down, right? But this is. This is all running on IPFS. So, also, <laughs> the gateways right now. Whenever you hit a gateway, you round robin through a whole bunch of DNS records to various gateways around the world, and then those themselves round robin through a set of through the same set of sort things again instead of accessing the longer one, because we wanted to stress like accessing from a whole bunch of different gateways to make sure that the system was actually working. So when you Fetch something from the gateway, 
a lot of work is happening that isn't needed, and so if we optimize it, then it'll be a lot better. So we can do that. It's just we're getting there. We're just limited in terms of like engineering bandwidth. Um, cool. I'll have myself here. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so. Here, you want, you want no, this? I, I think this will work now. Thank you so much, Martin, for inviting us, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, so any questions you have, ping us on IRC or GitHub. Uh, bugs, feel free to talk about it. Lots of people hang out on IRC, so you can ask questions there. Um, yeah.